Thank you all for coming. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory <coughs> Committee Forum called Just the Facts About Online Youth Victimization. Uh, my name is Tim Lorden. I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee that's hosting this event. The honorary hosts are Senator Leahy, Congressman Goodlatte, and Congressman Bauscher, and we're, we're thankful for them for helping us put this together. Um, today, we have, we have assembled the foremost experts on the issue related to child uh, online victimization or teen victimization uh, in, in the country. Uh, and and I've, I promise not to lay it, on too, the, lay it on too thick about how important these four people are, um, but I'm really not going to uh, abide by that promise. Th these are really, truly the, the best researchers in the country that are looking at this very issue about how kids and teens go online and whether they're having problems, whether it be exposed to inappropriate content or exposed to uh, inappropriate contact, whether it be by adults or by their peers. And we thought that since Congress, since last uh, it's past two years, it's really been frenetically putting together legislative proposals uh, dealing with this issue, um, varying from age verification to data retention to the Deleting Online Predators Act and, and the like that we thought we'd just present, um, get the researchers to talk about the state of the, state of the issue. I and mean, these, these folks don't deal in the legislative workings and what proposals <laughs> get at what, but if we thought if we could put together a panel of experts that could lay out the facts about what's happening, it could better tailor and inform uh, the decision-making process. So uh, with, without really further ado, uh, let, me, let me introduce uh, our panelists, and they're going to give some opening statements about the research uh, that they've done and what it says to them about the, the current state of the issue. And then we'll go into some moderated Q&A and, and also some questions from all of you. Uh, we'll wrap this thing up pretty quickly um, by no later than 1.30. So let me just um, introduce them one at a time in, in the order that, that, that they'll speak. First is um, Dr. David Finkelhor. Uh, he is the Director of Crimes Against Children Research Center and the co-director of the Family Research Laboratory um, at the University of New Hampshire. Um, professor Finkelhor is also a, a professor of sociology there. He's dedicated most of his career to the issues of victimization, child victimization, and family violence. He's been working on this um, in this capacity since 1977. Um, he's literally written the book about some of these issues. Um, along with his colleagues, he has written uh, perhaps the most authoritative uh, and comprehensive pieces of, of, of research that we know of with regard to the instances of, of child victimization and exposure to inappropriate content. Um, he, the, the data um, that he has authored with his colleagues um, is probably the most quoted uh, data that you've probably taught, heard up on Capitol Hill and often the most misquoted uh, data that you've, you've heard on Capitol Hill. Um, next, we'll go to Dr. Michelle Ibarra. Um, she's the president of Internet Solutions uh, for Kids. Uh, Dr. Ibarra has published several articles about youth harassment, online sexual solicitation, and mental health challenges of young people. Um, she's trained in, as, in child mental health services and holds a doctorate in public health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And again, uh, Dr. Ibarra has co-authored with uh, Dr. Finkelhor some of the major uh, works on this particular issue over the past uh, uh, five years. Uh, then Amanda Lenhart, who um, you may see quite often because she does live in Washington, D.C. and work here, um, is a senior research specialist with Pew Internet and American Life Project. Um, she's been working with the project since its inception. Uh, she holds, uh, she did her undergraduate work at Amherst College um, in anthropology, which is appropriate for this particular panel, and English. Um, she did her graduate work at Georgetown University. Um, the research areas that Amanda does at the Pew Internet American Life Project um, include uh, children, teens, parents, the internet, digital divide, education, content creation, blogging, and instant messaging. So she covers the waterfront essentially on those issues. And then we're going to do clean up with Dana Boyd, um, who's a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, she, where she's a PhD candidate. She's also a fellow at the University of Southern California's Annenberg Center for Communication. And according to Dana, and I, I really should read this, um, her, her research focuses on how people negotiate a presentation to self to unknown audiences in mediated contexts. Um, and maybe she can explain a little more about what that means. Um, and not to embarrass uh, Dana, but um, the Financial Times has dubbed her the high priestess of social networking. So, sorry to, and I'm so, so without further embarrassment to our panelists, um, let, let me just open it up to um, opening statements from uh, uh, Dr. Finkelhor and, and et al. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's nice to be here. I have to say, yeah, it's, it, it teaches me a lot about American democracy that the quality of the intellectual content here seems to be higher than the quality of the food. So I think it's a, 
Um, I like I like to uh, put this a little bit this issue a little bit in context by thinking about it in terms of a variety of other kinds of threats that we get excited about uh, as a society. Uh, and, and whenever any of these new threats su suddenly burst on the scene, like you know SARS or school shooters, uh, I think it's just absolutely crucial that we characterize them accurately and as soon as possible. Uh, because really, first impressions in a lot of these topics turn out to be the lasting impressions. And it's very hard to change people's ideas about what's going on after they've gotten one of these first impressions. And we, and we need those impressions to be accurate, not just to prevent overreaction to some of these problems, but I think also to get people to do the right things to prevent the spread of the dangers. Now, in the case of Internet sex crimes against kids, um, I'm concerned that we're already off to a bad start here. Uh, the, the public and the professional impression about what's going on in these kinds of crimes is not in sync with the reality, at least insofar as we can ascertain it on the basis of research that we've done. And, and this research has really been based on some large <laughs> national studies of cases coming to the attention of law enforcement as well as two large national surveys of youth. Um, if you think about what the public impression of is about this crime, it's really that we have these internet pedophiles who move from the playgrounds into your living room through the internet connection, who are targeting young children by pretending to be other children, who are lying about their ages and their identities and their motives, who are tricking kids into disclosing personal information about themselves or harvesting that information from uh, blogs or websites or social networking sites. And then armed with this information, these criminals stalk children, uh, they abduct them, they rape them, or even worse. Um, but actually the research and the cases that we've gleaned from actual law enforcement files, for example, uh, suggest a different reality for these crimes. So first fact is that the predominant online sex crime victims are not young children. They are teenagers. There are almost no victims in the sample that we collected from a representative sample of law enforcement cases that involved a child under the age of 13. And the predominant sex crime scenario doesn't involve violent stranger molesters posing online as other ch children in order to set up an abduction or assault. Only 5% of these cases actually involved violence. Only 3% involved an abduction. It's also interesting that deception does not seem to be a major factor. Uh, only 5% of the offenders concealed the fact that they were adults from their victims. 80% were quite explicit about their sexual intentions with the youth that they were communicating with. So these are not mostly violent sex crimes, but they are criminal seductions that take advantage of teenage, common teenage vulnerabilities. Uh, the offenders lure teens um, after weeks of uh, conversations with them that play on teens' desires for romance, adventure, sexual information, understanding. Uh, and they lure them to encounters that the teens know are sexual in nature with people who are considerably older than themselves. Um, so, for example, Jenna, this is a pretty typical case, 13-year-old girl from a divorced family, frequented sex-oriented chat rooms, had the screen name of Evil Girl. There she met a, a guy who, after a number of conversations, admitted he was 45. He flattered her, gave, sent her gifts, jewelry. They talked about intimate things. And eventually he drove across several states to meet her for sex on several occasions in motel rooms. When he was arrested in her company, uh, she was reluctant to cooperate with the law enforcement authorities. S many of these cases have commonalities with this particular instance. 73 percent of the, of the crimes, the youth go to meet the offender on multiple occasions for multiple sexual encounters. The, lo the law enforcement investigators describe the victims as being in love with or feeling a close friendship for the offenders in half the cases that they investigated. Uh, in a quarter of the cases, the, the victims actually had run away from home to be with these adults that they'd met online. 
So this is very different, I think, from the predominant impression that one might get from how these cases are being presented in, in the media. And, um, and also, I just think the inferences people make. And I think it has a lot of implications for prevention, just to go to that point. Uh, we, we can talk about some of these things in greater detail. But first of all, we think it means that our prevention messages really need to be directed at teenagers themselves in language and format and from sources that they relate to. Um, so much of what we've been doing has been directed primarily at parents, but parents' credibility and authority have worn thin with this age group, and especially among some of the kids who we've found to be at most at risk for this kind of victimization, and these are kids who've been victims of sexual or physical abuse, or kids who have substantial conflict situations in their family and with their parents. In addition, we think we have to go way beyond the kind of bland warnings that have been typical of so much of the prevention that we're doing that you shouldn't be giving out personal information. Uh, our research actually looking at what puts kids at risk for receiving the most serious kinds of sexual solicitation online suggests that it's not giving out personal information that puts kids at risk. It's not having a blog or a personal website that does that either. What puts kids in danger is being willing to talk about sex online with strangers or having a pattern of multiple risky activities on the web, like going to sex sites and chat rooms, meeting lots of people there, uh, kind of behaving in what we call uh, like an internet daredevil. We think that in order to, to address these crimes and prevent them, we're going to have to take on a lot more awkward and complicated topics that start with an acceptance of the fact that some teens are curious about sex and are looking for romance and adventure and take risks when they do that. We have to talk to them about their decision making if they are doing things like that. So for example, we have to educate them about why hooking up with a 32-year-old guy has major drawbacks to it, like jail, <laughs> bad press, public embarrassment. Um, we, we have to educate them about the kind of ploys that people that they're going to meet online might use to gain their trust. We have to talk to them about why they, they should be discouraging rather than patronizing sites and people who are doing offensive things online. Uh, fascinating as that may seem to them, but why that's not a good idea, why it encourages them and maybe puts other people at risk too. And unfortunately, these aren't easy sells. Um, you know, it's just like discouraging kids from drinking or smoking. Simple scare tactics really don't work well. Um, the effective strategies require deft maneuvering within the complications of teenage psychology. And I don't think we really know all the answers to that yet. We haven't got it figured out. It's going to take more careful development and testing. And in the meantime, I think we have to be cautious about promoting messages that turn teens off or that betray completely unrealistic ideas about internet and what's going on there, which may only make them less receptive to authoritative sources later on when we have other things that we want to communicate to them. So I think we have to do our homework. We have to do our research here. You know, a lot of what happens online is hidden. And so we, we need good research uh, to find out more about exactly what's happening, what the dynamics are, where, where young people are. Uh, we have to understand what's going on. I think it's as simple as that and as complicated as that as well. Dr. Ibarra? I want to highlight a couple of things that Dr. Finkelhorst said because I think they deserve repeating. First, things that we assumed that we assumed to be true did not seem to be borne out by the data. For example, we assumed that if adult men are meeting young women online, deception must be involved. We assume that if young people are posting and sending personal information to other people, this must place them at greater risk for victimization. Yet the data suggests that the vast majority of young people who are meeting adults online are not deceived and instead knowingly, at least as knowingly as a young person can, consent to this relationship. And we're learning that it's not the sending and posting of personal information that increases one's risk for victimization online, but rather engaging in sexual conversations with people they know only online, harassing others online. These behaviors seem to be most strongly associated with increased risk for victimization. Over and over, our assumptions turn out to be not reflective of the experiences that youth tell us. And this is important. Because if we're to keep young people safe, we need to understand what truly puts them at risk and what the risks truly are. 
Second, we need to understand that the issues are complex and they may be difficult to talk to kids about, but issues about sex usually are. Easy one-liners are unlikely to accurately reflect the reality that kids know online or measures that are likely to reduce the risk of victimization online. We need to stop trying to scare our kids and start trying to hear what they're saying to us. One child told me about seeing a website that shows dead and dying people, some know it as a snuff site. And she was really kind of disturbed by what she saw. When she tried to talk to her parents about it though, they thought that she was kidding. And so they refused to even engage in a conversation. It's not that they're bad parents, they're just not listening to what their child is saying. We need to listen to what our youth are saying to us. I also hear about how parents are so overwhelmed with new technology, MySpace, instant messaging, everything, that they don't even know where to start. It's almost as if this new technology is so new that it requires new parenting skills. But the same rules apply. Just as you need to know where your children are before, during, and after school, and who they're with and what they're doing, the same applies for the internet. It's as simple as talking to your kids about who they're with, where they are, and what they're doing online. And I want to make clear that all adults need to be talking to kids. The responsibility does not lie just with parents. That includes teachers, legislatures, babysitters, aunts and uncles, all of us. And by kids, I don't mean just young kids. I mean middle teenagers and especially older teenagers because it's the older teenagers that are most frequently reporting the harassment and sexual solicitation. <coughs> We need to understand the internet from their perspective, what it is and what it isn't. And by doing so, we can help them understand even more what the internet is and what it isn't. Otherwise, they're likely to think that we just don't get it and ignore what we're saying, and they might be right. Third, we need to put data in perspective. One victimization is one too many. You watch the, the television, however, and it makes it seem as if the internet is so unsafe that it's impossible for young people to engage on the internet without being victimized. Yet based upon data compiled by Dr. Finkelshor group, of all the arrests made in 2000 for statutory rape, it appears that 7% were internet initiated. So that means that the overwhelming majority are still initiated offline. And I want to talk about this statistic that a lot of, of us are familiar with, this one in five uh, young people are targeted by unwanted sexual solicitation, it's now one in seven. What do we mean by unwanted sexual solicitation? Because there's a lot of unclarity. When we talk about unwanted sexual solicitation, we're talking about being asked to talk about sex, being asked to provide personal sexual information, or being asked to do something sexual when the young person is not comfortable with it. And these can be very serious and upsetting events. This is different, however, than being solicited for sex. If we are to keep our kids safe, we need to work with data, and we need to know what these data are telling us about the risks that youth are facing online as well as offline. <coughs> and I also want to highlight another type of internet experience that youth are facing, which is cyberbullying. The estimates vary, mostly because uh, measurements still vary, but it appears that between 3 and 7% of young people are targeted by frequent bullying on the internet and text messaging. And by frequent, I mean at least once a month or more often. We find that youth who are targeted for internet harassment are sometimes distressed by the incident. They're more likely to report social problems, depressive symptomatology. They're more likely to report interpersonal uh, victimization being beat up by other kids, having things stolen from them. This is truly an emerging adolescent health issue. And it deserves as much focus as sexual victimization. I urge you to help us think about policy applications of our data for internet harassment. They may include fostering um, inclusion of te technology-based harassment programs in existing school anti-bullying programs, encouraging schools that don't have anti-bullying programs to implement them. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the internet is good. The internet has brought us together in many ways. It's made us easier to connect with people we care about, to get information that is important to us, to even express ourselves and who we are. Like any environment, however, like the school, community, the mall, 
The Internet has opportunities for both positive as well as negative behavior and exposures for young people. We are all here today because we want to make a difference. We know that the issues of Internet health and kids are complicated, and they therefore require a complicated response from us. But with research, using research to inform decisions, we have the possibility of formulating legislation that has a long-lasting and positive impact on the vulnerable, vulnerable minority of youth. Um, as some of you know, my colleague Mary Madden and I released a report just last month titled uh, Teens, Privacy, and Online Social Networks, um, which had a number of new findings that I think are quite relevant to this briefing, which I'll, I'll go over. Um, but first, I want to start with a little bit of context. Um, we need to remember that 93% of American teens between the ages of 12 and 17 use the Internet. So it is nearly ubiquitous. Um, However, when we start talking about online profiles, it's a lot less. 55% of online teens have an online profile of some kind. That could be at an instant messaging site. That could be, um, it could be at a, in a chat room. But for the most part, they are on social networking websites. Um, social networking websites are places like MySpace, Facebook, Bebo, Tagged. Um, I'm not going to define them right now, but in questions, if we'd like to define what a social networking website is, the panelists can go at it on that topic. Um, but I also want to highlight that 45% of teens do not have a profile on social networking sites. So while I think there's this impression that social networking really is a ubiquitous experience for teens, it's not. Among older teens, it is a greater part, <coughs> excuse me, a greater part of their online experience. Um, but for younger teens in particular, it is not as large a part of their online experience as I think we might think. Um, there's been a lot of concern that teens are giving out too much information online, as we've been talking about here today. Now, we've heard that perhaps this isn't what necessarily results in victimization, but it may have impacts on their future job prospects, on their future ability to get into college, on their global reputation, among other things. Um, and what we found is that teens are cognizant of the fact that they do need to limit the amount of information that they need to give out online. And they're taking different steps to do so. So 66% of teens with, an with a profile of some kind online restrict access to that profile in some way. In most cases, those teens are making their profiles private and available only to their friends or those who are in their friend network. Um, th of those with currently visible profiles, about 45% of teens are actually posting false information um, to those profiles. Now, in some cases, that's for fun, um, but in other cases, that's um, as a way of, of, of shielding their identity, of protecting pieces of information uh, about themselves from others. Um, other teens just simply, and in fact, most teens, simply limit the information that they share online. Um, we ask teens, do you share your first name? Do you share photographs? Do you share your uh, city and state name? And we found that only 10% of teens actually share both their first and their last name on their online profile. A lot more just share their first name. Um, an even smaller percentage share first name, last name, photographs, and city and state. So teens are restricting the amounts of information that they do share uh, online and on their online profiles. So that we know that teens are taking steps to preserve their online privacy, but how many of them are actually being contacted by strangers? And now I will say that our research at the Pew Internet Project does not look at sexual solicitation. It looks only purely at online contact by people unknown to you and your friends. Um, we found that 32% of online teens had ever been contacted by somebody unknown to them and their friends. Um, it's 43% for those who use social networks, so it's a little bit higher. Um, it is important to remember broadly how stranger might be defined. Um, on many social networks, um, you can be solicited by a band asking you to listen to their new song posted to MySpace. Um, you might also be um, solicited truly by somebody who is a peer, who's interested in looking for new friends, or by somebody playing a joke on you, um, somebody you already know who's using a new username, created a new fake MySpace page. Um, but it also could be an adult with perfectly perfectly innocent or not so innocent intentions. Um, but I think what's also going on here is there's real tension in social networking because the point of the social network is to put a profile of yourself online 
for the purposes of connecting with others. Um, in many cases, that's a network of people you already know, but you still want to be findable by the people on the peripheries of, of your offline network. So the kid at school who's in your chemistry class, the person on your sports team or who you know from church, you want them to be able to find you online. And so the tension is between trying to be findable for the people who you want to find you and not findable for everybody else. Um, so let's get back to the teens who were contacted online, this 32%. What did they do when they were contacted? Well, 65% of teens, two-thirds, ignored it or deleted it. They brushed it off. 21% uh, said they followed up with the person to find out more about the person, which could be construed as either a risky act or uh, the act of somebody who's simply curious about somebody who appears to be a peer. 8% um, followed up and asked to be left alone, and 3% actually informed an adult. So how many of these teens were actually made uncomfortable by this contact of those who were contacted? Less than a quarter of teens who were contacted said that the contact made them feel scared or uncomfortable. To put that number in its full context, that 7% of all online teens have had some kind of stranger contact that made them feel uncomfortable or scared. It's not that large of a number, and I think not the number that we might have had in our minds from the media coverage of this topic. So to wrap up, where do parents fit into this picture? Parents are a part of a teen's internet use, or, uh, well, teens might prefer that they were not, but t parents are involved. They're in the home. They bring the computer into the home. They provide the internet access. Parents are taking steps to actually keep their child safe, to protect them in a variety of ways. It's not all parents, but it is, in some cases, the majority of parents. So 53% of online households have filtering software installed on the computer at home. 45% of online households have monitoring software of some kind on the computer that the children use. 65% uh, of parents report checking up on their child after the child has gone online. Um, parents also make rules about internet use. 85% say they have rules about where ch teens can go online and the kinds of information they can share. 69% have time use rules. And these rules are actually um, the internet as a medium is more likely to have rules than either the television or video game playing. So what's the message here? Many, but not all, teens are taking steps to protect their privacy online. Many, but not all, parents are taking technological and non-technological steps to regulate and monitor their child's internet use. And while a third of teens have been contacted by people unknown to them, most of them brush off that experience. So what's next? The answer, of course, from a panel of researchers is more research. Um, in particular, research like that conducted by Dr. Ibarra and Dr. Finkelhor, as well as by Dana Boyd, um, research that helps us to understand the nature of the risks that are occurring, who is really at risk, and then how to tailor messages to reach those kids. Thanks. Uh, I was asked to do qualitative cleanup because the way that I collect data is quite different. I spend my days and nights hanging out in the places where teens hang out, in parents' homes, in schools, in you know different kinds of parks, at parties, you name it, I kind of visit there and talk to teens of all different uh, sorts from all different parts of the country. And you know what's interesting is to realize that by and large what you see is not that different in many, many ways than what you are familiar with in your own communities. And what you see that happens online mirrors and magnifies what happens offline. And that mirroring and magnification is actually really critical because it means that the good, the bad, the ugly that you see offline comes in online. And what is weirder about that mirroring is that it's often the kinds of stuff that adults normally don't have access to that is mirrored. It is the conversations that happen in the school locker rooms. It is the conversations that happen behind closed doors, the things that actually put teens at risk um, that normally parents wouldn't see that they now can see. And so typically the tendency is to blame the technology rather than realizing that there's a much broader, deeper problem or situation to actually address. And the other issue that is that it magnifies it. And that magnification can be good, right? This is how you get um, you know, 50,000 kids to stage a protest because they've used the technology as a scaling force to realize that they can communicate with one another. It also means that when they want to torment one another, the magnification can be very great as well. 
But this, this process, it's, it's you know, very easy to look at the technology and assume that the technology is bad. And I worry about a lot of the band-aids that happen because they're often meant to get rid of what we can see rather than getting rid of the root causes. Um, over and over again, what I see from young people is that when they're in trouble offline, it seeps onto online and they look for validation both from peers and from people beyond that if their peers are part of the problem. Um, and this is actually where there's a set of danger to be, to be made. There are two in particular kinds of um, offline dangers that I see, or offline home situations that I see put kids at risk. One is the abusive parenting situation. And this doesn't necessarily mean physically abusive, although it can. It means verbally abusive. It means absent. It means um, all sorts of negative home situations that make home a not safe place. You know, one of the things that I often ask teenagers is how they perceive of home. And it's amazing how many see it as less of a private space than school. Right, because the home is not safe for a lot of kids. And when it's not safe, they go online because online is more private than offline for them. They go there to seek uh, you know, some sort of solace in, in communities that might not hurt them. I talked to a boy in Iowa who had just gotten out of the hospital because his father had beaten him up so badly, father being an alcoholic. And he kept running away, and the police kept bringing him back. Right? And it's a situation that's just, it's so heart-wrenching to watch. And he knows that he goes online and that's his community of people that love him no matter what and aren't going to beat him up. On the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, which is probably more uh, familiar to some of you, is what happens when there's a level of pressure, unbelievable pressure that's placed on kids by their parents. The pressure to get into the Ivy League school, the pressure to get straight A's, the pressure, pressure, pressure to succeed. This is also almost always middle and upper class communities. Um, and this is kids who are told that no matter what, they're not doing it right, they're not winning the games, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not succeeding. And they're cracking. And their parents, most of them are extremely well-intentioned. Um, and they really want their kids to succeed, but the pressure is breaking them. And when they see this kind of pressure, they, they, when they crack, they do some pretty damaging things. Some of this we see as self-harm, things like cutting, anorexia, bulimia. Some of this is reaching out to people who have more freedom online. Interestingly, I deal with a lot of these kids who are reaching out to older adults, right? Not 45-year-olds, but the aim is the college senior. The 21-year-old who has a car, who can get alcohol and who can get freedom. Right? And these are the people they want, they just like, they have this dream of freedom because their home, again, is not free, so they're desperately seeking it out. So when we look at all, you know, the stories that we get, and I can't agree more with what we're hearing, you know, they, they're hearing them too. They hear all of the predator stuff. The number of times that Dateline comes up in my interviews, I want to die. Yeah. Dateline sort of says the worst of the worst. The fact is, if you are a police officer pretending to be a 14-year-old seeking sexual solicitation, you can get it. Anyone, any one of you can get it. But this is not what the teenagers are doing. In fact, they don't even recognize a lot of the, the sexual solicitations that are what we would normally talk about. They see it as just another dumb, sketchy guy trying to sell them something because they're so used to being marketed to that they relate those sexual contacts as marketing, and their approach is, you just delete that. Right? That, that's all they think about it. Interestingly, when I have them go through examples of sexual solicitation in the home, I've gotten more images or, or sort of feedback of Viagra ads. They, they see that as a sexual solicitation. So there's a little bit of confusion also as to what is spam and scamming and phishing and marketing and what are sort of the, the problematic content that they receive. Um, but most of the real sketch balls, they delete unless they're, and then, unless they're actually seeking it out. And that's a whole separate version of what goes on. Um, what goes on f in terms of bullying is also has a similar valence to it. Most of the bullying is happening by people that they know, um, unless they are part of online communities where they're trying to get to know larger groups of people, because they don't tend to, you know, hang out in places with um, unbelievable numbers of strangers. Um, there, you know, even in a place like MySpace where there is theoretically 170 million strangers there, they, their world, they don't search, they don't look around. They hang out, they go, and they immediately log in and check their messages, they talk to their friends, they reciprocate comments that they received. Um, and most of the bullying that you see comes from, it's, it's more women than men, it is, you know, ways of negotiating status or controlling status within the school. A lot of times what you see is a continuation of the same patterns, if it's, even if it's not the same people of the offline places. 
Um, sibling uh, games are intense. The interesting thing is how many people see their actions as pranks, not bullying. So most of it is, is that they're, they're trying to just sort of joke around and, and jokes go a little too far. Um, and people, you know, some of it is, is to the point of a little bit humorous. Uh, for example, you know, I've been tracking what happens when people break up. Like when, you know, teenagers break up with one another. And so it's like, you break up with me and I get pissed off at you, so I'll start sending, you know, as many SMS messages as I can so that you're in trouble with your parents. Right? This is this amazing tactic of trying to use the technology, and they don't even see that as bullying. They just see that as, like, you know, getting back at you for breaking up with me. Um, so there's also some levels of confusion. You know, when I look at what can be done, you know, I, I have to say, I, the legislation proposals drive me mad. And the reason is, is that, you know, regardless of whether or not things are technologically feasible, like age verification, the kids who are lying about their age are doing it for good reason. Often better reasons than their parents who are lying about it to look younger, right? Which is pretty common. Um, but they're, they're doing it to just sort of get away and, and to move away from the spaces, to move away from the advertisers who they see as their primary predator, right? Because they're constantly being solicited to by people who want to make money off of them. Um, and so they're, you know, the age verification thing, it doesn't, it doesn't actually solve the relationship problem at all. Um, you know, parental permission to be on these sites, oh my God, so many of the kids who are in most danger Parental permission will put them more at risk rather than less at risk. It's, you know, the good, good kids already have parental permission. They're already having the conversations. In every positive household I've been to, there's a conversation between the parent and child. What I desperately, desperately, desperately want is street outreach, digital street outreach. We do this in the streets of our cities where kids who are running away, we go and we talk to them. You know, in some cities it means handing out condoms and clean needles at the most extreme cases. Some of it is much more relaxed and laid back and more like, hey, do you need some help? We do this with guidance counselors in schools. We do this with police officers when they're hanging out and they see kids sort of causing trouble on the streets. We don't have the digital street outreach that we need, which are not people that hold direct power over kids, not people that are going there to get them into trouble, but to make sure that they're okay. You know, I've, I've notified police all too often on um, kids who I look at and I go, uh-oh, problem. Um, and almost always when I hear of a kid who's killed their parents or I hear a kid who's done other terrible things, I go to their profile and the signs were there. The signs were all extremely there. We all know the story with Columbine. It was all online. It was all reported to the press long before the incident took place. And the press did nothing. You know, these kids are in trouble. They give huge signals of their, of their difficulties. And this is an amazing opportunity for intervention because of the mirror and magnify because we can finally see what it is that teenagers are going through, instead of going around trying to obscure it, let's try to actually help them. Well, what, I, what I'd like to do, thank you all for, for those opening comments. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is actually go to Q&A. I have one question before we do, so if, if you can all think of what questions you have at the top, tip of your tongue, um, please uh, get them ready. Uh, I want to ask a question about the profile of the kids that are getting into trouble. And, and if we can create a, create a profile, a statistical profile, if it has to be, uh, what do they look like? And so it, we can target either messages or legislative proposals towards that, that, that profile. And then later, what I'd like to do is kind of pick up on uh, the content issues. And one thing none of the comments addressed was um, uh, and something Congress is interested in is access to inappropriate, age-inappropriate content like pornography and, and the like. But, but first, with regard to the statistical analysis that Dr. Finkelhor addressed and everybody else elaborated on, um, who are the kids that are getting into trouble? You said that there are uh, 13 to 15-year-old girls um, that were having some serious psychosocial issues. They're reaching out. Um, is that, what, are they, what do they look like? Um, how many of them are there out there? Is this a very common, um, uh, common situation, a common profile, or is it particularly rare? And, and if you tailored messages, or, uh, what would it look like? Would it be uh, to 13, 15-year-old girls, don't talk to older guys about having sex? On, is that the message that, that we should be building our campaigns around, and how do we direct it to them? Well, it's good. I, I wish I knew all the answers. Unfortunately. We have more information on what they do online than we do on, at least from our research, and other aspects of their life. But we do have this sense of being victimized in other places and ways and having difficult uh, relationships with their parents. I would guess, I don't know the exact percentage, I would guess we're talking about 5% of, um, of the cohort. 
Um, and um, um, the, um, and we need to think about multiple ways of reaching them. Obviously, online m messages in, is one source, but probably these kids have access to a variety of other people who know about problems that they're having in other aspects of their lives. And we have to alert, for example, people in guidance departments at schools and mental health agencies and uh, family counseling agencies about things that young people may be doing online and difficulties they're getting into. It is a little bit concerning to me that I think people in the mental health field and the child protection and social work ends of things do not tend to be uh, particularly computer internet savvy. So it's not a place that they automatically go or know about. And, and when, if they were armed with more information uh, to help them ask, you know, impart information to the kids and ask questions that might allow them to identify someone who's at risk of getting into, into trouble online, I think that might help out. Michelle? I really like this question because it, it raises the issue. Is it the internet that increases the risk of kids or is it kids that are increasing their risk? So, I mean, is it the internet that's causing victimization or is it the, these um, life situations, these characteristics that kids have? And what if instead of trying to address the internet, we try and address the kid? And I think that the first thing in that uh, plan would be to recognize that these kids are likely experiencing multiple challenges. Kids don't grow up in vacuums. They tend to not have one type of victimization. They tend not to have one type of problem. It all comes together, which means that one-liners, public service announcements are important. They do lots of really good things. They also, you know, uh, for example, they do good things for in terms of public perception and, say, stigma. They are not good at in doing intensive interventions. That's not what public service announcements are. And these kids need intensive interventions. And I think that, that what Dana was talking about is so important and that maybe we should talk a little bit more about it. It's recognizing that perhaps the biggest impact we could have, instead of restrictions on places in the web, on websites, perhaps instead of public service announcements, is funding these types of intensive interventions for those young people who are greatest at risk. I just make, sure. just one other group that I'm concerned about, and uh, it's, it's a difficult group to address, and those are kids who are having sexual orientation issues. I think that um, unfortunately we don't have enough research on that specific group, and they are, you know, they're relatively small. But our research suggests that particularly boys who are looking for information about sexual orientation stuff go out online because they don't feel like they're authoritative and trusted places they can get it locally or in the, from members of their family. And that's when they run into trouble because they, they encounter people there who want to victimize them. Well, if I could interject, just one, one point is that the presumption, we've been doing uh, in online safety education to parents for, for a decade now. Uh, our organization does get NYS.org and, and the cornerstone of our, our education um, has been don't share, tell your kids not to share their personal information with online in any way, shape or form. And that really, I, I can think back 150 times uh, where I've been in places where I've said that's the number one message. Now, Dr. Ibarra and Dr. Finkelhor, you've authored a, a paper in February of 2007 which basically says that puts you, that, that that message is all wrong. Uh, it doesn't put you statistically at any greater risk of having a problem uh, than, than other, other issues. And so in a way, a lot of us in the child safety advocacy field have said, well, uh, we've been messaging all wrong for a decade. And I think some of the congressional attention on this issue was predicated upon that, that, that cornerstone, don't share your personal information online, social networking sites, where they basically allow you to share a lot of personal information online, but you're saying that that, that doesn't necessarily lead you to higher risk. Can you comment on that? Can you elaborate on that? And, and how could we have been so wrong, meaning us? <laughs> I actually do think you had a side effect that was really positive, which is that the college admissions officers and the uh, future bosses have not been able to find them. I think that side effect has actually been very positive, and that's actually how it's been repurposed. Like, that's what you hear kids finally repurposing it is they heard it because of sexual predators, but they realize it's like, oh, phew, now I can't be found when I'm going into college. So it's, it's kind of had a funny f effect. Obviously, I think do we do want them to think about issues related to what they want to disclose. And, and 
for all kinds of reasons, and it's, it's a decision-making decision thing that we should certainly get them to think about. But if, if we're really, if, if the issue is preventing sexual victimization, I don't think it's the top issue. And um, um, I, I actually, frankly, think we're going to have to do more research before we have really the answer of just how to go about doing it. I think we need to take a variety of these messages, pilot them, you know, focus group them, um, you know, and, and, and really see what takes. Michelle? I think um, this is just one of many instances where we're very well-intentioned. I mean, it, it, you know, we were wrong, but we were well-intentioned. We just spoke before we had the data. Um, and I know that we're now beginning to sound like broken records here, but I, I, I can't tell you just how important it is. Because, as you know, legislation has such a huge impact. And if we guide with our gut instead of data, you know, the, the worst consequence is that we just miss. You know, we miss our target. That's not the worst. I mean, that, that we could miss our target or we could actually, you know, do some, there could be some unintended consequences. I think it's so very important. Um, you, you know, and here, so we talked to about 1,600 kids about, between the ages of 10 and 15, about their experiences on the Internet. And kids who said they had been targeted by sexual solicitation, we asked where it happened. Okay. So about a third of them said, and we're talking about frequent kids who have been targeted by frequent solicitation, so it's happening about once a month or more often. A third said that it happened in a social networking site at least once. But 47% said that it happened while they were playing a game online. 23% said it's happening while they were, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong, wrong line. Don't scratch that part out. So 34% on social networking sites. But 50% on email and 20% in chat rooms. So we need to keep everything in perspective. We need to have, have not only data, but understand how it relates to other data. And I think that also some of it is about relating to the offline and connecting it. I think that there's, de I, I totally agree with the points that were made about, yes, when you see kids engaging in sexual conversations online, they're at risk. The question is sort of where does that come from before that? There's an interesting side effect of um, other policies that were made, my favorite of which is um, the difficulty at, it, there is now to acquire a fake ID means that there's a deep incentive for minors to reach out to 21 plus year olds to get them alcohol. You would like to think that alcohol has gone away in the schools. That's not even close. Um, in fact, it's gotten worse in a lot of places that I'm seeing because kids are so bored out of their mind because school's actually more boring and all of the sort of new research that's coming out about schools that it's actually more boring to be in there than it was in the years past. Um, Great. Um, so, but what you what you hear from you know I had this I had this kid point blank. He's like, "Give me something to do and I'll stop drinking." And I'm like, "Working on that, honey." Like, <laughs> um, so there's drinking hasn't gone away. But when you start to see kids making relationships with 21 plus year olds to get alcohol, they start to form a set of patterns, you know, about these much older interactions that play out both offline and online. Um, Drinking is not something that I think is going to go away anytime soon until we find ways of relieving the massive amounts of boredom. Um, but uh, if we recognize that and we can watch the kids who are do engaging in those kinds of risky behaviors, we can see it play out online too because a lot of it is deeply connected. Um, the other things that are just deeply connected that I see over and over again, pressure, abandonment. Um, you know, one parent abandonment is usually a huge issue. Workaholism by parents. Um, that's in the middle upper class. That's a huge, huge problem, and usually a big indicator of uh ohs. Um, poverty on the other end, um, and which usually also results in parents not being home at night because they have night jobs. Um, those are the four forces that I see continuously offline, resulting in risky behaviors online, um, and risky behaviors in school, and risky behaviors elsewhere. Um, a really amazing. It's now 10 years old, which is fascinating to me, um, PBS special, Frontline special, was called The Lost Children of Rockdale County. And I think that they actually captured the, the dynamics of, of what was going on in middle upper class boredom, and that it's actually gotten worse than that because you no longer have the, the um, uh, parking lots to hang out in, if you, especially if you live in towns that are all big boxes now. So there's no place to hang out, and it's really interesting to see what they try to do as substitutes for hanging out. Um, and the Internet is a substitute for hanging out when there is no other place to hang out. 
One other thing that I'll just add is that, you know, one takeaway is that we, we were pretty effective at getting out this message about getting, about keeping your personal information close to your chest. I mean, what we heard in the focus groups that we did was that teens really were quite, particularly younger teens, particularly girls, were quite concerned about keeping their personal information private online and that their one main concern was being findable physically. Like they were afraid of this mythical 40-year-old man um, who would come after them and hurt them. Now we know we're starting to realize that that's extremely, extremely rare, but that is what teens fear. And to a certain extent, the messages that we've gotten out about privacy, about keeping your information safe, has created a sense of fear in teenagers, but has also created this particular behavior that we were looking to create. So on one level, we were reasonably successful, though maybe not in the way we might really have wanted to be. Okay, well, thank you. I, um, I'd like to open up to any questions that people have at the moment. Sir? Is there any research in yet on having threats, be it uh, sexual assaults or just bullying, or following these children, be it cell phones, be it uh, other mobile devices, be it TikTok, or anything that would be used to uh, target teens or teenagers in the future? Yeah, so we have a number of studies that have been done on this. I mean, I see it some, I, I ask all the questions qualitatively. Um, they don't have location based phones yet by and large. I mean, they're just not there yet. Um, they're starting to exist in the market, but not in terms of what teenagers have. Um, the bullying is peer-to-peer. -peer. Like, there's definitely peer-to-peer -peer bullying um, because you have to have somebody's cell phones. Interestingly enough, prank phone calling, which was a favorite of my generation, doesn't actually seem to exist as much anymore. And I don't entirely know why. Um, but they do, they do get those, you know, they do get each other's numbers um, through word of mouth networks. But you're not getting the random phone calls or any of the random strangers at all. Like, I have yet to hear of a single incident of that. You know, it's more like wrong numbers. I mean, they all get wrong numbers. We have a little bit of data. We um, talked to kids about some of the messages that re they're receiving on text messaging. About 14% said that they had had a rumor spread about them at least once on text messaging. 10% said that they had received a sexual, an unwanted text message that was sexual in nature. And then 6% said that they had received a sexual picture that they had not wanted to receive in the last year. And with regard to geolocation, uh, in the wake of the E911 legislation that Congress has passed, is all the handsets in America are being capable of geolocating, uh, being by law enforcement also in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. I think we're on the cusp of that. We actually, this, this organization had a briefing last week, a uh, three-hour conference on mobile, uh, location meets social networking. And the question is, when, when youth and, and other people can locate each other on the street, uh, what are the implications of that? I think we're almost there. Helio is a, a cell phone service in California uh, that has just launched um, their Buddy Beacon. Um, there's another service called Looped, which is available for Boost uh, wireless users. So you're starting to get penetration and only like a couple hundred thousand um, in that marketplace. I, it's coming. Right. They're, not, they're not by and large teenagers yet, but it's young, coming. Young adults, early adopters. Uh, Paul. is that um, most schools have preemptively blocked these sites and blocked anything that lets you communicate with each other. Now, they have all figured out proxies on how to get around it, um, but the, they don't use it as much in school. In fact, it's actually problematic because it's created yet another digital divide, um, which is just great to see. Um, and actually, the digital divide is what's motivated the proxy. So middle upper class kids don't actually look at the sites at all online. It's the working class kids who have no access off um, at school. The behaviors, by and large, I mean, th there's offline behavior at school, but not, you know, mediated. The exception is the cell phone. The cell phone text messaging in the classes has already started up. Um, but this is not that it's permitted. <laughs> in fact, it's explicitly banned in every school. You can't text message during class, and that doesn't stop anybody, just like note passing didn't, and poster writing didn't, and graffiti didn't go away. Um, but so most of it is, is happening 
at home, and it's mostly happening at home when they have tons of time and they're really bored, which translates to after parents go to bed. But, like immediately after school and after parents go to bed. Let me suggest an idea on this. A concept that's turned out to be very useful in combating bullying and also date rape is the mobilization of bystanders. It turns out that there generally are people around when bullying is going on or when there's a threatening sexual situation who see something but who typically don't do anything about it. And those are people who typically have fewer problems than the people who are getting victimized and maybe have more resources to kind of either intervene directly with, with, with one of the parties or appeal to somebody else to intervene. And I don't think we've thought enough about how to mobilize bystanders on the, on, the, on the Internet. One of the things that's really interesting from our research is how few of the kids and the parents we talk to um, have any idea of where to go for help. Or have any idea, or have ever, even when they've, they've encountered pretty uh, uh, uncomfortable things, have actually told someone about it or, or reported it. And I think we need to think more about establishing on the web and places where kids are mechanisms for alerting them to where help can be gotten and where they can report things and what resources are available. Um, there's a, there's a, it's, it's a, it's a kind of form of community building. I think people and kids and adults don't feel a sense of responsibility for what's going on in the internet neighborhood yet. Um, and I think a good model of a place where they've had to establish kind of norms that allow for the reporting of bad stuff is eBay. Because eBay really couldn't operate if there was a lot of bad stuff going on there. And they have, to do, they have to implement a lot of mechanisms to create social trust there. And so everybody gets to rate everybody else after all their interactions. And people's ratings are kind of highly publicized. And I think people know exactly what they can do when they've gotten ripped off. Um, and I think those kind of mechanisms need to be uh, available at a lot of other places. So for example, if people knew when going into a site um, how many other, uh, what, what percentage of the people report something that happened to them there. It, it might allow people to make choices about where they want to go. Backing up, as if I can, on your point about bystander mobilization, um, not being personally familiar with what education programs are out there in the school, it seems like a number of schools have programs. And some people say Virginia's got a thing that's being used as a model by somebody. Anyway, is, is that a piece of it? In other words, are, are students taught not just for their own activities, what to engage in? It, it is part of the comprehensive bullying prevention and education programs that are now being used in schools. But I also, I mean, I want to make clear that risk identification is really hard. So that it, it's one thing um, to kind of mobilize bystanders and say, hey, you know, something's going on, this kid's being bullied and we need to stop it. But, but um, not all kids that show risk signs actually engage in risky behavior. So that is to say that, you know, as we know, not all kids who are harassed are distressed. Not all kids who are distressed are distressed because they're harassed. So, so identifying that group of kids is, is difficult, but there are things to do, like mobilization. I think also one thing to think about is how we can extend services offline, online. So for example, where do kids go to get support in the community? And what if we also created an online community, extended that community to online? Uh, one example would be, say, the, the suicide hotline. 1-800-SUICIDE, which is, there, there's data to suggest that it actually does make an impact. People call and it does um, prevent suicide. What if there was a chat? So the kids who are online and suicidal, instead of having to pick up the phone, are able to chat. That's how they communicate now. I mean, so just kind of thinking about ways that we can extend traditional services into the online world. The, the difficulty with a lot of the sort of collective behaviors, uh, you know, for example, even in the school, the bullies tend to have power in the school. Um, the adults tend to actually support them having power in the school because often these are the jocks. These are the people who have structural power within the school who are engaged in a lot of the bullying. 
And, you know, those in, in those dynamics, nobody wants to get in the middle of it because they don't want to be the victim of the jock just for backing the, you know, the sort of dweeb or whatever dynamic it is in, in the situation. The same goes out online because these are people they know in school. And so even even getting them to collectively intervene, like, you know, the, the kids who do intervene are the really well-intentioned kids and there is some success there. The difficulty for me is, I, I don't look at even some of the intervention, but be like, those kids who are bullying, they are in trouble. They are engaged in that very problematic behavior because they're usually getting bullied themselves by some other you know, adult in their life. So stopping, stopping it isn't just a matter of it, you know, intervening at that level. It's about figuring out the broader systemic problem that is motivating this you know, sort of dog kick dog kind of behavior. Um, and that's really difficult because this goes back to, you know, more often than not, absent parents, <laughs> absent on many different levels, um, will, you know, prompt that kind of uh, attitude. And so th this is where it becomes a more systemic issue, which, you know, is, you know, as a researcher is fascinating and as a lawmaker has to be frustrating as anything uh, because there's not just one thing that will sort of put in and, and solve the problem. <laughs> Let me just get to pick. Yes. Uh, I have a question about effective methods of messaging for a target audience that you've identified or tied to being marketed to. How are we going to engage them in ways so that they get the messages that we want them to have? We partner with advertisers who figured it out. I mean, you know, I, I, I think as, as vilified for rightfully so, as they are, cigarette companies figured it out. So it's not that it can't be done, and it's not that people don't know how to do it. It's that we need to form partnerships. We need to get good people who are good at what they do all together in the same building. And, and I think that we need to be careful that people who don't know what they're doing recognize that and not try and do it. So that pe we should get people who know how to message to kids because they've done it, they've sold other products. We should partner with them to get them to sell healthy behavior. And also remember that it's a moving target. I think once you've are, you, I just think about the whole brain on drugs, um, which was successful for the first year or two was out, and then it, it kind of morphed into kind of a, a collective joke. You know, this is your brain on drugs with the side of bacon. Um, you know, it's you you have to you have to keep your message moving and remember that teens are changing a lot. Coolness changes. And you and every marketer who's trying to market to teens is trying to figure out how to do exactly what you want to do. Can I, can can I, I think build on that question? I, I hear a lot in a lot of different circles um, based on the question, how do you message to teens? Um, and, and, and keying off of Paul's question, um, is a lot of what I hear is people saying what we need to do is try to enlist teens to message to other teens the appropriate messages. What do you think about peer, peer messaging? Depends on the status of the peer. I mean, that's that's the difficulty, right? You have the like goody two shoes kids messaging. You're not going to get very far. Um, the interesting thing that has worked that I've been playing with is I. Um, Luckily, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of different groups within MySpace. Um, and one of the groups that I work with is uh, bands. And one of the games that I play with bands, that, I mean, celebrity really matters to these kids, whether we like it or not. One of the dumb things that I do is that I get, like, some of the cool bands to, mess, to, to leave comments on the like, geeky kids' pages, which amazingly raises their status and gives them sort of, like, something that they're really stoked about. And just what it does to sort of balance out the dynamics. And so some of it is about recognizing the structure. It's not just pure messaging in a broadcast, but we live in a Web 2.0 era. These kids are participating in a Web 2.0 era. It's about doing these relational uh, engagements. And if you can leverage you know, meaningful celebrities to do some of these interactions to rebalance some of the social dynamics, it's impressive what can be done in the classroom. So all we have to do is get Bono off of the Africa thing and on to the... Bono is not quite Heavenly. the right <laughs> okay. target <Heavenly>. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen? Um, I'm just interested to know if any of the academic research or the street research has been looking into some of the virtual worlds like Second Life and some of the massively multiplayer online games and what's going on there and what we should or shouldn't. I mean, I was curious about your digital street outreach. I can imagine an avatar flying in and saying, don't do that. What, what we, what's, the, what's the research and, and what, what would be a good way to reach out in those spaces? 
So what we know of Second Life, I know that everybody's fetishizing it to no end right now. Second Life is not a place where most teens are hanging out. The teens that are hanging out are the geeky teens. You don't have to worry about, by and large, the teens that are currently hanging out on Second Life, and I don't see it picking up anytime soon. Yeah. World of Warcraft is a different game. A totally different beast. Uh, World of Warcraft is often the ostracized kids. Um, it becomes their social space. It is, it is a different kind of geeky kid. Um, and you know, it, it is a very masculine environment where you, you gain status by being this huge orc and you can kind of run around and beat up people in the game. Um, there's, you know, in some ways it's an amazing outlet for people and it's also one of the few spaces other than church where I've seen genuine um, age diversity in a social activity which I have to say is a blessing because we don't have situations where people are running around with older people. And so the kids who are running around and wow with actually have more street outreach than anybody else because there's a lot of, you know, well-meaning adults who are like, don't do that. You're not going to, you're not helping the guild. Um, and so when you have really good guild masters who are sort of looking out and being like, stop being a 13-year-old, you know, um, amazing things happen. And actually some of the dynamics in there are unbelievably healthy. Uh, and I've been astounded by it. There's, research is really in its nascent stages. Most of it is done by the people called Terra Nova, T-E-R-R-A-N-O-V-A. -R -R um, they do an amazing job of documenting everything that they're, they're doing online, so there's, it's really accessible. And they're just finding, you know, it, it's brid bridging parent-child gaps for the kid. You know, a lot of parents are participating with their kids. Okay. Um, it is one of the few places online where it's okay to be in a whole room full of strangers because guilds are by and large strangers, not people you know offline. Um, and it's been really, really healthy for the kids that participate. But I don't see it as something that I expect to see all kids participating in. But for the kids who have been participating, you know, there's some problematic behavior that seeps through, but a lot of it's been in check in better ways than a lot of other sites. Just to put that in perspective, so we ask kids, you know, what are the two top, what are the two activities you do online that you spend most time doing? So pick two. 17% said social networking sites, but 47% said playing games. So it, it's it's common activity for a lot. But of most kids. of the games that they play are not they're they're casual, what are called casual games, which means that they're playing against a computer. They're pay, playing, you know please let me shoot the little thing until it goes away, you know, like that kind of stuff. So it's it, the, those who are engaged in the immersive virtual worlds like WoW, like EverQuest, you know, are really immersed, right? They're, they're there all the time. But the majority of gaming, when you actually sort of work through and ask them about it, isn't that kind of immersive gaming. And before I get to the porn, uh, one more question. I think there's a lot of hands <laughs> over here. Any questions, sir? Tell us, please. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have a potato. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, again, I think um, we need to recognize the difference between well-intentioned and 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 versus things that can can make a true impact. I think what helps the most in my experience is having a really, really, the person who writes the legislation needs to have a really, really, really strong understanding of how the technology works and how it's being used. And if you understand that, and I think hopefully what we've done here today is given a little bit of insight into some actual data that talks about these. Get the data, understand what's going on, and then make legislation based on that, on when you know something rather than on a hunch that we all have. I don't want you to get, get what I'm saying wrong. One of the main things that the federal government has done is funded law enforcement to get trained to do uh, policing on, on the Internet. And I actually think that they're doing a very good job. 
um, the Internet Crimes Against Children task forces that have been set up all, all over the country, the training that they provided for local law enforcement. I think, by and large, it has been very solid. And um, one of the problems with the Internet is there's this sense that it's a no man's land, that there's no one in charge, that there's nobody patrolling the neighborhood. And I think it's good that we have people patrolling, and I think that the, the law enforcement need training in all the, the different techniques that are available and be, being part of that bystander community there. Um, and so I would certainly, I'm a strong supporter for providing more funding for law enforcement to get that kind of expertise. Um, I don't know whether there's a legislation, le legislative role here, but I am concerned about the vigilante and the dateline and the entertainment dimension of this. I don't think that that is a particularly good development. I think dateline is to be um, congratulated for raising a lot of uh, awareness about the problem. But I think now there's a big risk that it's, it's getting institutionalized, that it's metastasizing, and other people are getting involved in the act. And I don't think this is a good development. This is a highly technical and professional activity that needs to be done by well-trained professional law enforcement people. And there are lots of dangers. I, I really foresee the potential of some very bad um, uh, activities going on, discrediting the whole undercover um, um, effort that the good law enforcement is doing in this area. Um, so I don't know. I don't know whether there's actually a legislative solution there, but I definitely think that there's kind of a public pressure or a, that opinion leaders can take that to, to emphasize that this is something that we want our official law enforcement professionals to be doing, not combinations of vigilante groups and, and entertainment uh, corporations. Just back, like I agree that the law enforcement is doing an amazing job of a lot of things. I mean, and even some of the companies are working well with law enforcement to make certain that information flows. And we have to say that that's amazing to watch. Um, but I do think that it's, there are roles for police officers that are not just about enforcement of laws. And most of the roles of police officers online have been about enforcement of laws. And that is actually scaring away for the teens from even engaging with them, right? Like, if the police is going to see a, you know, a, a red cup and assume that the kid's drinking and going to get them into trouble with their school, which is happening all over the place, they're not going to want to talk to them. They don't want to talk, you know, if they've got pictures of graffiti in any form in the background on their pictures, they're not going to want to talk to them because they've been arrested for tagging. So there's, there are roles that are also for people that can play that are not just about going to get the kids into trouble that I think that we do need to be funding. This is social work. This is, this is people who are really well intention and realize that sometimes these kids are doing drugs. Sometimes these kids are drinking. Sometimes these are kids are engaging in things we don't like and are going to accept that and help the kid move in the right direction without just getting them into trouble. And we, and, and we need to be funding and legislating more that actually supports and helps that and that effort um, rather than running away from it and rather, rather than just assuming that it's all about enforcement. Okay. Um, I, I promise we don't have much time left, but I wanted to get to the porn. And um, another aspect, we did a, want, a lot of unwanted contact, and now um, a major issue that everybody's concerned about if we unpack it is, is access to age-inappropriate material um, by young people, teens, uh, younger youth. And the seminal work, um, the Youth Internet uh, Safety Survey uh, from 2000 and 2007 that Dr. Ibarra and, and Finkelhor uh, participated in, um, basically shows that from 2000, while, while sexual, unwanted sexual solicitations, however that's defined, as you define it, have gone down in that time from 2000 to the follow-up study in 2007, the, the um, exposure to unwanted uh, sexually explicit material has actually gone up during that time from 2000 to 2007 from 25 percent to 34 percent. And if I could ask you guys to comment a little bit about that and what you think that means. And secondly, um, one thing that has caused a lot of stir in the circles that I work in is that in one of the papers you've written, you've written that um, exposure to sexually explicit material has become normative as a teen experience. And, and that is disconcerting. Well, um, it has increased. I think it's increased for several reasons. One is that the the spammers got more creative of how they were doing it, and of course, bandwidth increased. A lot of people in the time between 2000 and 2005 got hooked up on, you know, uh, in, in ways that it was easy, much easier to, to, to access pictures. Um, 
it is it has become normative in the sense that it's much that it is very common but it's also become normative in the sense that I think that the vast majority of young people kind of dismiss it as kind of litter on their information superhighway um, and when we ask them you know did this was this a problem for you did this have any negative effect on you they say no um, but there are a small percentage of the kids who have fairly intense negative reactions, particularly to the unwanted exposure. Uh, I think, one, because it's unanticipated, um, unlike pornography exposure in the past where I think young people tended to have some ability to anticipate that they were going to see it because the kids over there were making a fuss about it or you know their friend was telling them what they were going to see. Now they're, they're being confronted by it when they weren't anticipating it. I call this kind of an ambush exposure, which is something I think that is developmentally new. And I think also there's probably been a change because there's, they're likely to see more extreme images than w was conventional in the past. And to be honest, I, I think there's reason to be concerned about the kind of impact that these that this may have on this small group of kids who report it's negative, but we really don't know enough about it. Um, we don't know if there are developmental residues. It really hasn't been studied. Um, and if there are, we don't really know much about how to protect them from those impacts. So I, I would say the vast majority of kids is not a problem for, but this small number, and we don't know exactly how many, I think that's a very, uh, that's a concerning issue, and I, I really feel like it's a, it should be a priority uh, to do some research on that. For me, it's also, it's not just an unwanted contact for young people. Adults don't like it either. And I think that there's this interesting issue where it's like, what does it mean that, that the technology enables certain kinds of ambushing of things that you're just like, ooh, and how much do you run away from it? Uh, most of the time, most of the, this content, the first point of access is via email, via spam. Because um, actually the search engines have done a decent job of cleaning things up, surprisingly. Um, and it's interesting to watch what this, the effects the spam has. Young people aren't using email like we did. They don't like it. They think it's filled with spam. They don't, it's just the right? They don't, it's all, you know, spammers, scammers, fishers, marketers, parents, authorities, adults. There are no friends there. They don't want email, <laughs> right? And so the, e the, the primary communication for peer-to-peer -peer has moved to a combination of IM, SMS, and social network sites as the way of peer-to-peer -peer communication because it's seen as less filled with crap. Um, and so I think that as we think about you know, issues around this, um, every single one of the major technology companies that hosts this, host this stuff is trying to get rid of spam. You know, this is not something like legislation, frankly, doesn't make the, the technology capability happen. Every, every company has a deep, deep, deep incentive to make this go away, and they've been working very hard to, and it's really really hard, right? Like Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail, um, AOL, these are, your, these are your players for email that are still stuck with it. And so I think that there's a certain amount of balancing to realize that like there's a, there's a deep corporate incentive to not have it, um, but they're still failing as hard as they try. Dr. Ibarra? Well, I think also it's important, again, to put everything into context. Um, and we don't as far as I know, we don't have data about how many unwanted exposures to pornography or even sexual images that youth are having in other media. But we do know that um, television, movies, media is filled with sexual images. So I think that's an important point. I, I do have um, data on intentional exposure because there also has been some voiced concern that with the increased ease of access on the Internet to pornography that maybe kids will kind of lose themselves, if you will, and, and there'll be this huge avalanche of young people intentionally seeking out pornography. And the data don't seem to support that. Um, we have, so about 10% of the youth that we talked to said that they'd use the internet to look intentionally for pornography. In comparison, 13% said that they've looked at pornography in magazines, and about 10.5% have looked at pornography in movies. So kids are looking, but it doesn't seem like it's a much more common or any more common source than other traditional sources of pornography. One, I guess one point that I'd like to make that it isn't often recognized, uh, it hasn't been really well publicized, there's a lot of concern about the impact of 
pornography and other dangers online and its ability to corrupt um, young people today and create a generation that is kind of irretrievably uh, sexualized. But the data suggest that since about 1995, around the time that the internet really began to take hold, rates of sexual assault and sexual abuse have actually been declining. They're down about, they're down over 50% since 1992. Um, that rates of teen pregnancy are down very substantially, I think almost about a third since the mid-1990s. And, um, um, and sexual intercourse at an early age has actually been declining as well. So, I mean, I think there are things that we need to be concerned about, but there isn't any evidence from some of the macro indicators that we have that we've somehow seen a, um, a terrible corruption of a generation of youth. Well, let me, um, let me just uh, close by saying, and I'm going to ask each of the, um, that was a great closing, uh, if we can go to the rest of you for a 30-second wrap-up. But before I do that, um, Dr. Fink some of the Dr. Finkelhor's uh, studies are up here. Uh, Amanda has a uh, two-pager on her studies at the front desk. All, a lot of the research is posted on, the, on our netcaucus.org website. I think we emailed everybody that RSVP'd to this, um, a list of that research. Um, and I've published various versions of it. I can give you a card where I have stuff online. And that's linked to on the website as well. And um, I want to thank all of you for, for coming from great distances in many cases uh, here to, to brief Congress. I want to thank everybody for their patience and, and coming to this briefing today. I know there's a lot going on in Congress right now. Um, but in closing, um, can I just le let you be 30 seconds to wrap up and uh, we'll call it a day? Am I supposed to go? Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I would say that um, I, I actually just want to reflect back on this panel and say that it's really exciting to hear and to get together this group of people to talk about these issues because, I, I mean, I, not, not, my, not to, to toot my horn, but I do think that the others here assembled at the table are really some of the foremost researchers on this topic and to hear them come out and talk about this in a dispassionate but I think really accurate way has been delightful. So that's my wrap up. That's good. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today, and I guess I would just want to reiterate um, that uh, these issues are complex. They require us to be thoughtful, which we are capable of doing, assuming we stop and, and do it, and uh, to recognize the distinction between the technology and the kid. I guess my only request is to realize that the technology is new, and many of us didn't grow up with it, but the practices are old and continuing on, and that we need to look at how we deal with the practices, not just fearing the new things that we don't yet understand. Well, I'm honored, and, and thank you all for being here, and, and thank everybody for coming today.